Okay. Okay, so first of all, greetings to everyone. <coughs> Thank you to <coughs> JLE, our hosts, as usual, and thank you to Gemma, our JLE expert, for making this work. Thank you to all of you for joining me again. Mitra, I see you are uh, starting to overdose. Welcome. Howard, nice to have you again in Toronto. Avital Batsheva, the brands, nice to have the brands with us from South Africa. Phil and Lisa, welcome. Yechiel, nice to have you here. Avram, Dr. Avram in L.A. <laughs> you spend all day on Shirim. Carolina in Ozana, California. Zev, welcome. <coughs> Anton, okay, forgive me if I don't greet everyone <coughs> in detail. In, in particular, don't see everyone necessarily, but... Greetings to everyone who's with me. Let me please remind you that um, I only see the people who are logged on through the JLE. So if you're watching this streaming, I'll say that again because I just saw the streaming came on. If you are watching this year on some other streaming platform, then I don't see you. So if you have a comment or a question, not comments please, questions. If you have a question... Uh, please feel free to email it to me through the JLE. Very happy to answer. If you are with me on the JLE platform, please use the chat option. Um, I can't actually hear you, but because uh, it's a large webinar, but I can see you typing me a chat message. Forgive me if I miss it in the course of the class. If I do miss it, forgive me, and then please email me. Try to pick up the questions as I go along, and in this particular class, I will try to leave <coughs> time at the end specifically for questions. So the discussion, as you remember, I, I'm sure we have two programs with, that we are running. One is a Wednesday night, one's a Monday night, and one is Wednesday night. When I say night, I'm in the UK. And the Monday night program is a program on mitzvahs. We've called it Actions of the Soul. Wednesday night, we've called it Thoughts of the Soul. These are two, two different categories. And Monday night, we've tried to model on studying a mitzvah each, 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 each occasion, each session we take a mitzvah. We try to look at it in depth and we began the series based on the Derech Mitzvah Secho, which is a classic Hasidic work dealing with the spiritual and usually deeply Kabbalistic reasons behind the mitzvahs. That's our agenda. Wednesday we look at ideas, but on Mondays we look at mitzvahs. Delving, if we can, into the depth behind the mitzvah, trying to get away from a simple rote ritualistic performance of mitzvahs and understanding where they're coming from in the spiritual world, what they achieve in the spiritual world. That's the classic contribution of the Derech Mitzvah Secha. A lot of it is technically Kabbalistic, so a lot of that we don't go into, but a lot of what I'm trying to do is convey what he says or at least give you the background for understanding what he's saying. I'd like to deal on this particular session with the mitzvah happens to be one he does not deal with directly but try to take this mitzvah and look into the depth. And that is the mitzvah of tzedakah. Tzedakah, giving what we call in English charity. I'd like to try to show you two things here. <coughs> One is the spiritual depth, <coughs> the thinking, the mechanism, if you like, behind the mitzvah. Some of what it is designed to achieve. And then we will switch gear and try to talk about some of the practicalities of the mitzvah. I would like everyone to walk away from this session inspired by knowing what this mitzvah achieves and how important it is, what it builds in the spiritual world, and also walk away knowledgeable about some of the practicalities so that this mitzvah can actually be fulfilled correctly. Please feel free again to question. I'm very happy to answer if I can, but let me try to build an overview, first of the spiritual depth of this mitzvah, and secondly, the practicalities. I'd like to recommend a book here, if you'd like to follow up on this, before emailing me with 100 questions about the details. Here's an excellent book, highly recommended. That's called Stocker and Miser, written by Rabbi Taub. This is an excellent book published by Artscroll. This book gives you a wonderful introduction by Rabbi, Rabbi Taub, Rabbi Baruch Taub. He, he, if I'm not mistaken, is Rabbi Shimon Taub's father. And the Rabbi Taub Sr. writes a wonderful detailed introduction, giving you some of the philosophical background, which I'd like to, 
like to acknowledge as we'll, we'll go through some of that. And then the bulk of the book is dedicated to the actual mitzvah. One of the uh, good aspects of this book is, as you'll notice, you see it has a very clear text, and then the bottom half of the page, and sometimes more than half of the page in Hebrew, is the original sources. So the beauty of this book is, if you're a beginner, and you don't have the Hebrew or the technical learning skills, you can get a very, very good overview, digest, and practical uh, sense of the practical rulings. If you are in, in, interested in following up on the actual original sources, they are quoted in great detail. Most times, as you can see, not simply a reference, but actually the material. So this is a wonderful digest and gives you more than an overview. Very, very competently done. There are many books on the subject. This is a good one to start with. So let me, first of all, let, let's, let's, let's enter the first zone of this study of this mitzvah, before we get to the practical, understanding what it is that this mitzvah is meant to achieve, beyond simply the fact that giving is an aspect of generosity, develops your kindness, right? It's a responsibility in society to give to those who don't have. That, I presume, is clear to everyone. What I'd like to try to study is something radically deeper. And what I'm thinking of is this. You know, when our lives are in the balance, namely <coughs> Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, right, a time when our lives are being judged, <coughs> life for the coming year hangs in the balance. Something very interesting we say at the high point, or certainly one of the high points of the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur service in the Sun of extremely emotionally tense, fraught part of the prayer said by a prayer composed by a tortured and dying individual, very, very dramatic, and at the climax of that prayer, which focuses on life and death, who shall live, who shall die, we say, Utfila, Tshuva, Tfila, and Stoka, Ma'avirin Esroya Hagzera. Remarkable statement. We say there are three things Tshuva, Tfila, and Stoka. Teshuva, repentance. Prayer, Tfila, and Stoka, charity, can convert or subvert a divine decree. Let's understand what's being said here. There are three things that are so powerful, or perhaps we should say so unique, that even if there's a divine decree, this is Rosh Hashanah after all, life and death is being decreed. Even if there's a decree for death, these three things can annul a deathly decree. They have to be immensely powerful to overturn a divine decree. Divine decrees are not made carelessly. If Hashem, if God is making a decree, on this particular individual, does not deserve to live, does not have, in, and of course we know we're talking here about spiritual life, this person is devoid of spiritual life, that decree has been issued in exact measure for what this person is and deserves. And these three things can avert such a decree. They have the, they have the radical power to take a decree that has already been issued and subvert it or null it so that you no longer have a deathly decree hanging over you. That, a moment's thought, will show you that this is beyond radical. You're not talking about gaining a new merit or praying in such a way that you convince Hashem not to issue it. You're talking about a court that has issued a decree. There's been a judgment. True sentence has not yet been carried out. That's true. That's true. But there's already a, an issuing of an edict. The spiritual, the heavenly court has come to a decision. And one of these three things, each of these, doesn't necessarily have to be all three, I think it's a good policy to avail yourself of all three. Right? De definitely. Definitely. Why not? If a patient is suffering from a deathly illness and we have more than one chance, one more, than one, more than one method of cure, why not? Use them all. Quite common to mix antibiotics. Why not? But, but in theory, any of these three, each of these three individually has the power to annul a deathly decree. Let's think about that for a moment. What is unique about these three things? The, the, the right Torah way to answer, to ask the question here, let, let's try to formalize this correctly. What I, what I hope to achieve in these sessions of our learning together is not only some material, but also methodology. <coughs> How does one think about these things? How does one think about Torah? How does one approach a Torah subject? Well, when we have a source like the Machzor, right, written by cosmically great composers, Right, which we say at the high point of our lives hanging in the balance on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, 
we see that they stated that three things can annul a decree. The right question to ask here, there are two questions to ask. Two questions to ask. Let me give you ten seconds to venture a, an attempt. Type for me, please, those of you who are with me on the, on the chat system here. Let me challenge you. Type for me, please, two salient questions, and I'd like the right questions. What are the right questions here to ask when we are told that these three things can avert a deathly decree? There's a, there's a pair of questions that need to be asked here. I'm getting a few <coughs> people each giving me one. I want somebody to give me both. No, 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 no. Yeah, some people are asking me, how can God change a decree? Okay, we're not going to deal with that in this session. Well, I've got a long list of answers here, <coughs> but no one's given me both. No one has given me both. No, all three are not necessary. Only one is necessary. No, no one. Can no one, can no one tell me what the two questions are that need to be asked here? No, no, no. I'm not asking about general questions about death decrees. I'm asking you when I tell you that there are three things that can annul a deathly decree. They are Tvila, Chuva, Chuva, Tvila and Stoker. There are two questions that come to mind that need to be asked together. Please help me. Help me. Come on. Make my day. Why is everyone only giving me one? one? There are two questions that go hand in hand here. What must they be? <laughs> Carolina, that's a very creative question. Very creative question. Well, the two questions are these. The two obvious questions. And if you don't ask these two questions, right, you're not focusing on the, I believe, on the correct methodology. The two questions are, what about these three things has the power to change a deathly decree? After all, we're not offering four options, or five, or six, or twelve or 613, we're offering you three mitzvahs out of the Torah that can change a deathly decree. The first question to ask is, what is unique about these three things that has the power to avert a deathly decree that do not exist in other mitzvahs? Right? Why does sending away a mother bird not save your life? Why does keeping Shabbos not save your life in this particular fashion? Right? Why is visiting the sick not change your life in this particular fashion? Why not even saving a life? Or attending to Aymona, attachment to Hashem. Or burying the... I mean, there's so many things you could have said here. Why do these three things have the power to avert an evil decree? And secondly, what do these three things have in common? If there are three things that have the same function in the world, then surely one should ask what they have in common. Those are the, that's the logical set of two questions to ask. I'm sure everyone can see that. Right? Chazal, the sages tell you, there are three things you need to do that avert an evil decree. The first thing that must strike you is, what is different about these three? And what is in common between all of these three? They must share a quality. Right? They wouldn't be lumped together. Our sages did not put three things in the same basket unless they fit together. Right? I, I'm laboring this point just to, just to bring out the logical methodology here. Okay, and therefore the two logical questions are, what is unique <coughs> about these, and what do they share? And I believe in this case the answer will be the same to both of those questions. We'll see that all three of these have a unique shared characteristic, and that characteristic is the defining characteristic that is powerful enough and unique enough, specific enough, to save your life. Before I, before I move on, is, is, this, is this clear? Can everyone see? that these indeed are the logical questions and the right ones to ask first? Give me a quick yes if you, if you see the point, if you get the point. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so we're training ourselves in a way to think. Let me tell you what these three have in common. Again, we don't have time, unfortunately, <coughs> to work through all three. So what we'll do is I'll try to give a... I'll try to... Joel, nice to have you. Nice to see you here. Haven't seen you for a while. Um, I'll try to give you a very brief overview of two of them and emphasize the details of Stocker. Obviously, each one will take a full session. And Yitz Hashem, without promising, we will do in the future dedicate a session to each one of them. This session is dedicated to Stocker. 
But as by way of introduction, <coughs> I will talk a little bit about the other two, just enough, I hope, to show what they have in common, and then we'll use that principle to open up the world at Stocker, hopefully having understood what is special and unique and life-saving about it. What is uni- let, let me say the principle first, and then try to take a step back and see it in action in each of the three. I'll say the principle in brief, what is unique about these three, why these three can change your life, and then try to prove it to you. What's unique about these three things is they change the definition of who you are. Carolina, you realize we're dealing with Hebrew here, right? Tefillah, Teshuvah, and and Tzedakah. Okay? The English words are not really relevant here. Okay? That's a nice poetic suggestion you're making, but it's not valid in the original. So stay with me here, please. The... um, these three things have, 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 have as a unique character that they are intended to change who you are. And the reason, again, again, this is a radical suggestion, the reason that these three, these three things change your basic nature, indeed, that's exactly what I'm about to explain. So, so stay with me, I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of, uh, a lot of very interesting questions. A lot of interesting questions. Stay with me, please. Hold the questions for a moment. Let me try to give you a suggestion of a mechanism here. <clears throat> There'll be time for questions. These three things change who you are. Each of them, at root, is a self-development, self-transmutational exercise. And if you can change who you are, you avert a decree, because the decree is no longer on the person you've become. <clears throat> I know this sounds <coughs> radical. <coughs> it even sounds perhaps like trickery. But we'll try to understand If a decree is issued on a particular individual and that individual becomes a different individual, it is quite possible, even probable, logical, that there's no decree on the new person. The decree was on the old person. If you change into a different person, there's no decree on the new person. By the way, this is the thinking behind changing the name of someone who's desperately ill. I'm I'm not saying it should be done. If at all, it should be done very rarely. But if it, do, if it is done, what's the thinking behind changing somebody's name? Because a name is a deep reflection, deep projection of what it is that you are. So somebody desperately ill, <laughs> there's a decree on this person to die, it would appear. If we change their name, then we could be changing an aspect of who they are. And it's possible that there's no divine decree on the new person that they've just been redefined as. Does it work? Is it correct? Should one do it? I'm not going into the changing of names now. Generally speaking, one should not change names. But... I'm going, uh, w- what I'm getting at is, if you can change the definition, now we're not talking about some fake change, right? If there's a decree issued against you and you have a very slick professional plastic surgery, take a new name, get a new passport, right, and trying to evade the law that way, not only, not only is the decree still operative against, against you, there's probably a whole new set of laws that you'll have to pay for as well in evading justice. We're not talking about superficial plastic surgery. Right, we're talking about a deep change. And here's the logic. If there, stay with me carefully. <clears throat> if there's a decree <coughs> issued against an individual, which by divine justice is deserved, and you become someone else, the reason there's no longer a decree on this new individual is because the original decree was designed to change this person, transform them. The decree is always, always, punishment in Judaism is always a correction, whether we see it or not. There's no vindictive punishment. Punishment is a correction. No loving parent would punish a child vindictively. You punish a child creatively, constructively. So any, cha- any punishment in Judaism is a correction. Well, if the de- punishment is designed to affect a correction, and you've just made that correction, you don't need the punishment. All right? Again, we're not talking about a court of law where a punishment is ju- judicial and statutory. Once it's been issued, it must be done. The law requires that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a parental type of punishment. If a parent is about to punish a child, to transform them into the child they should have been, an insensitive child, too much chutzpah, uh, some improper action against a teacher or disrespect for somebody, and the parent is depriving the child or putting them through a hardship, why are they doing it? To correct the child. If the parent sees that the child has just corrected, and the child has become what that child ought to be, the parent will pull the punishment. No point punishing someone 
when the effect of the punishment has already taken place. Right? I'm sure you can see that. Again, I'm not talking about a judicial system. There you can't know that the change is genuine. And therefore, if Hashem, if God has issued a punishment, a decree <coughs> against a certain individual, and that's what's necessary for that individual, and the individual changes to the individual they should be, then the decree is no longer necessary. It's not trickery. On the contrary, you're preempting the purpose of the punishment. And therefore, what have we, st- what have we, what have we understood? Uh, Orion, I'm not going to deal with that question right now. The, jo- the, the question of Rosh Hashanah is a spiritual, spiritual sentence. Right? We're not talking whether the person will physically die that year or not. That's another issue. But hold the question, please, for a moment, if you don't mind. Let's go through these and see how these work. And if you're with me, you'll see a fantastic parallel <coughs> between these three things. Unexpectedly, tshuva, tefillah, and stocker of all the mitzvahs giving charity, of all the mitzvahs of kindness, of all the mitzvahs of dealing with other people in a correct and loving fashion. <coughs> charity? Stocker? Yes? Stay with me. And I hope you'll enjoy this little journey. First of all, what is tshuva? Let's start with tshuva. What is teshuva? Repentance. Again, I wish there were time to go into the whole mitzvah fully. But here's in a nutshell, small nutshell. The mitzvah of tshuva is repentance. The word doesn't mean repentance. In English they call it repentance, which means remorse and regret. The word teshuva means going back. It means return. It means going back to the pure, pristine version of yourself before you did spiritual damage. It's a return to the original self. If you've returned to the original self, then you can drop off all the difficulties and punishment and corrections and efforts and tensions that are needed to change you. If you've, already, if you've gone back to the original pure and pristine self, there's no need for change. The reason tshuva can avert a punishment, again, I'm not talking about legal punishments. A court cannot know that a person's done tshuva correctly. And even if he's done tshuva, he might need certain sufferings or judicial executions as well. I'm talking here about the inner work. If tshuva changes you to become the kind of person you should have been, the person you were before you made a mess, then the d- decree can be averted. After all, the decree was issued against a person who is soiled and sullied and guilty of certain, certain serious spiritual punishments, uh, 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 spiritual infractions. If Tshuva k- successfully corrects the person, then the punishment is no longer, no longer needed. Let's, let's just to get one d- deeper feel. What's the definition of valid Tshuva? The Rambam says that the definition of valid Tshuva is, listen to his measure, Beautiful way of illustrating this. The Rambam's measure in the second, the beginning of the second chapter of the laws of Tshuva. The Rambam says, how do we know what is complete Tshuva, what we call, what he calls Tshuva Gemura, complete Tshuva, which means Tshuva out of love, not just out of fear. Tshuva out of fear is simply you wouldn't do it again because you're too afraid. Tshuva out of love means even if you could do it again, you wouldn't. <coughs> what is the de- measure? <coughs> A full Tshuva, says the Rambam. Here's the measure. If that person would find themselves in the same place that they were in once before, with the same temptation, exactly the same temptation, and this time with no variables changed, the same passion, the same temptation, would desist from the sin, only because of the internal change they've gone through, that's Tshuva. Do not misunderstand. This does not mean put yourself back in the same situation. That's a prohibition. Many people misread this Rambam. I've got to go find the same temptation face it and walk away from it. No, we don't walk into temptations. But he's giving you a spiritual measure. And the Rambam doesn't take any chances. He makes it totally graphic. He says, imagine a man who sinned with a woman, a woman who sinned with a man. And this individual, let's for argument's sake take the, the male component. This man sinned with a woman in a relationship. What's the measure of Chiva? If he would find himself again alone, with the same woman, in the same situation, with the same temptations and the same passion, you're the same perfume and the same sea breeze wafting in, you know. He doesn't say that, but he says the same exact situation. The Rambam makes it as graphic as it can be. And this time, he desists from the sin because of spiritual consciousness. That is called Shiva. Now, you may argue that it's impossible ever to be in exactly the same situation. Yes, that's probably true. That's one of the reasons why it's important to do tshuva as soon as possible. Right? It's written, for example, the Gemara says, do tshuva when you're young. Zechor is barecha b'yom b'chulo secho. Remember your creation, your creator in the days of your youth. King Solomon tells you it's worth doing tshuva when you're young. When you're young enough to still do the sin. 
Let's say you did a sin, terrible sin. Many, many years later, when you're a very elderly individual, you say, Hashem, I will never do that again. Of course you wouldn't. Your arthritis is too bad. That's not worth much. It has to be a situation, says the Rambam, where you're as capable. He makes it clear. Same temptation, same motivation, same passion, same physical capacity. And this time you walk away. So what do you see from this? This is not a central... Brad, I'm not sure what your question is. You'll have to rephrase it. But to hold the questions for a moment. What the Rambam is telling you is, the difference is that you're a different person. The passion is the same. The attraction is the same. The motivation is the same. The temptation is the same. What's different is you. And therefore, the reason you've done full tshuva and no, no, no longer need the punishment, or the spiritual punishment, is because you're no longer the person who needs to be corrected. You've just made the correction. So let's sum up at this point. Again, there's so much more to say about Shiva. But the important... Brad, you can see immediately. Think about that question immediately. You realize it was not a question of Shiva. Think about that, Brad. If ten people were punished for someone else's... Right? Those people were punished for, for people who had done things wrong many generations before. Therefore, obviously, these people is not a question of tshuva. This is a question of atonement. You can only atone for something you've done yourself. You can only do tshuva for something you've done yourself. You're talking about an example of people who were punished as a sacrifice for other people. Think about that for a moment. See if that's not clear. Let's go back to our subject. What do we say the defining characteristic of tshuva? Change in the self. Let's go to tefillah, prayer. Let's go to prayer. Stay with me. Stay with me. What is prayer meant to do? Again, we'll need to go into this in depth. But what is the mitzvah of tefillah of prayer? Well, the most difficult question to ask about prayer, the most relevant one, and even very young people ask this question, how can you hope to change God's mind? How can you hope to change Hashem's mind? After all, our prayers are phrased as requests. In fact, the Aramaic term for tefillah is by rachamim, to ask for rachamim, ask for mercy. You're asking for your needs. Think about the deepest aspect of our tefillah, right? the Amidah, the central work of our prayer. In the morning we go through five, four steps of elevation. Brachas, which is the natural world. Psukah de Zimru, which is the world of song. It's a high world, Kabbalistically the second of the worlds. The third level is Shema, where you say one. Hashem is one, where you become one with that oneness. And there's a fourth level, where you stand face to face, bonding and totally relating to Hashem directly. And when you get to that level, of total self-annihilation and bonding into the divine oneness? How do you express yourself? Uh, Hashem, this is what I'd, le- I'd like. Health and wealth and wisdom. You're asking for things. Why? Furthermore, 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 asking means you hope to achieve what you're asking for, which means you hope to change the mind of the one you're speaking to. If you're going to get it anyway, why do you have to ask? And if he's not going to give it to you because it's bad for you, asking is not going to make any difference. Stay with me. If a child asks a parent for something that the child needs, what normal parent is going to withhold something that a child needs? child needs food. The mother is going to starve them, starve the child, unless they beg. No, they're going to give them the food. And if the child asks the mother for something dangerous, right, like a six-year-old boy who asks his father for a flamethrower, or an army surplus bazooka, right, or a friendly crocodile, whatever the kids ask for, the father is going to say no. Ten-year-old boy wants an electric drill. The father's going to say, no, the kid's going to drill a hole in the cat. And therefore, if you ask Hashem for something that's dangerous for you, bad for you, He's not going to give it to you. And if you're asking for something that you need anyway, what loving father's going to withhold it? But on a deeper level, if you ask for it and He gives it to you, you just performed a miracle. You just changed God's mind. How does that work? And there are many, many other questions about tefillah. Many questions. And we'll study it in Mitzvah Hashem in depth. But let's just take that question. How do you hope to change God's mind? And the answer is, according to the Bala Ikrim, again, there are many, many answers to this. But the one I want to focus on for now, Rav Yosef Albo, the Bala Ikrim, he says, the point of tefillah, of prayer, is not to change God, it's to change you. If you change you, you can get what you're asking for, because the new person you've become could well use that thing. If this child, this teenager, this young person wants power tools, and he's too immature to handle the power tools. He wants a powerful vehicle. He's too immature to use the vehicle. The answer is no, because he can't use it. But when he's mature enough, the answer is yes. Not because you changed the one you asked, but you've changed the one who's asking. 
When the child wants power tools, the young man wants power tools, and he's mature enough to use the power tools, the answer is yes. Not because you convinced the giver, but because you demonstrated to the giver that you're no longer the immature person you were before. If you say to Hashem, you say to God, God, I need a hundred thousand pounds. Right? And God says, no, that will make you overconfident and, and, and um, egotistical. And then you use your prayer, you work on what you're asking for, you sublimate your desires. You come to want them for the right reason, not for the wrong reason. Of course you're working on desires, you're asking for what you want. You're not, you're not nullifying your desires. You're sublimating, you're elevating, transmuting your desires. So you want them for the right reason, like Nefesh Chaim says. The reason Hashem can now give you what you ask for is because you become a new person who could use them correctly. And therefore you can achieve what you want. So we see that the essence of prayer is changing the self. Interesting. What have we learned so far? We've learned that tshuva changes you radically to the point that it could save your life because there's no decree issued on the new person you've just been born as. Tefillah could save your life. Not because you begged for your life to be saved. That's useless. If it doesn't change you in any way. But if tefillah changes who you are, you want in a new way. Instead of wanting health and wealth and wisdom to enjoy. You want health and wealth and wisdom to enjoy using them to do your work in the world. Then of course, if you, if you stand in front of your boss's desk and you say, yeah, boss, this is what I'd like. Right? I'd like a, a much bigger expense account. I want to stay in the best hotels and drive the best vehicles. And The boss is going to say, why do you want that? If you say, well, I want to live it up on the company expense, it's going to throw you out. But if you say, boss, if you give me these tools, I'll bring back bigger deals for the company. Of course, I'll say yes. Why not? Unlimited yes. If you ask for a bigger expense account, but with a bigger expense account, you're going to whine and dine bigger clients. And you're going to bring home bigger deals for the company. <coughs> the sky's the limit. Hashem said, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Haruchev picha, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Ask me for more. The more you ask for, the better. Uh, if you bring home the deals. Now, of course, in the course of bringing home the deals, you can enjoy the stuff as well. If you're whining and dying your clients in the most lavish fashion in order to bring home big deals, and you're enjoying it thoroughly, that's wonderful. No problem with that. Your boss doesn't mind. And therefore, and therefore, if you come to want correctly, you change your dispensation. You're about to be fired because you're not bringing home deals. And you ask for a big expense account in such a way that you want the expenses to bring home the deals. You just renewed your contract. Instead of being fired, dying, you achieved life. Okay. So far, so good. Before we move to the third one. Did I convince you that's what's unique about these two mitzvahs? In essence, tshuva and tefillah, they are both direct works on changing the self. Every mitzvah changes you. Every mitzvah changes you. Changes an aspect of your being. But tshuva changes who you are in essence. It's a return to the original self. It goes back to the original self. And tefillah goes forward to what you want to be. Tshuva changes you, takes you back to what you were originally. And tefillah gives you the tools for becoming what you must become at the end of the road. So the two poles, the two polarities of your character, where you began and where you're going to, are changed directly by tshuva and tefillah. So did I convince you, please? Two out of three. Give me a quick yes, please. Thank you, Paul. Two out of three so far. No, please, give me yes. The Bogan family, good to have you with us. Thank you. I'm glad I glad I convinced you. Okay, let's go to the third one. What is stucca? Let me just see your question. What do you mean after you've changed yourself? Tefillah changes you in the act. I, I don't understand you. Somebody asking me a question, I don't understand. Tefillah changes who you are, redefines who you are. Your life is different going forward. Okay, let's go to the third one. How does stucca change you? How does giving charity change you? In what radical fashion? Let me again say the idea. Tshuva change you. Tfila. Tshuva change who you are. Stocker changes you, perhaps in the most radical way of all. Stocker means giving charity. Here's what it does. Stocker changes you from a taker into a giver. There's no more radical change than that. Let me say it as radically as I can. If you're a taker, you're anti-divine. If you're a giver... You're divine. God cannot take, can only give. If you want to be godlike in the world, you have to be a giver. This is the depth of the meaning of the sages. Whoa, I'm getting questions already. Hold the questions for a moment. Talk on ongoing phone after Yom Kippur. 
Brad, what's the difference when you give it? It changes you. What's the difference when you give it? Give it all the time. We'll talk about the halachic c- categories of wh- what and when and how. But right now we're talking about a person with a death sentence. This person is standing there on Rosh Hashanah with a death sentence hanging over him and he wants to change it before Yom Kippur. Give stocker. Give charity. It's not just a good thing to do. This could radically change. You're a taker and you don't deserve what you have in the world. You transmute yourself into a giver. You have radically changed from one pole to the opposite. Chose who you are. Let's understand this. This is the depth of the meaning behind the sages, behind the statement that we say, Soine matonis yechia, the verse. Soine maton, the one who hates gifts is alive. What does that mean? It means this, one who loves gifts is not alive. The one who loves gifts, you love being a taker. You want everyone to give you. you all, all you're interested in God for is for what He can give you. You're a taker. You're anti-divine position. He's the giver, you're the taker. Opposite end of the pole. The point of life is to become not opposite to Him, but like Him. He's a giver, you need to become a giver. Stock is the act of giving. Well, see, it isn't the only money. You give of your time, of your effort. You give in many ways. But stocka means, tzedaka means giving, with a particularly unique flavor, by the way. Stocker means something that is just, not chesed. Chesed means kindness for no reason. Stocka means, tzedek means justice. It means giving what you actually feel obliged to give. We'd have to see the depth. Jonathan, uh, what's, your, what's your question exactly? We didn't get into the technicalities yet about the intentions, right? Right now, the intention you need to focus on is... Right now, the intention you need to focus on is giving to become a giver. You've been told that a direct path to wealth is to give 20% of stocker. Oh, so you're giving the stocker to become wealthy, Jonathan? Let me read your comment. You've been told that a direct path to wealth is to give 20% stocker. So you're looking for a direct path to wealth? <laughs> You mean you're giving stocker because <laughs> you want to be wealthy? There's better motivations than that. By the way, you're right, it is a path to wealth. Not 20%. 10% is good enough. 10%. You're allowed to give 20 and we'll explain that. So, let's get this clear. This is a famous subject and we'll take a whole session to discuss fully. Rav Dessler goes into this in great detail. And that is, the point of life is to become a giver. There are takers and givers. The anti-spiritual position is to be a taker. The spiritual position is to be a giver. That is what he says. So you're either a taker or a giver. I'll just there's so much to say about this, but I'll just I'll just say one to bring out one aspect of this. And I'll say it's this. You know that just put it on a societal level. Yechil, if you do a virus, stealing from Hashem. You're a taker. Give you no position, permission to use that thing. Yechil, let's say you eat pork. Not you. One eats pork. Right? You're a thief. They're God's pigs. He never gave you permission to eat those things. You're stealing from his world. <coughs> You're definitely a taker. You're taking pleasure out of his world that he never gave you permission to use. Right? Think about it. You'll see this. Yeah, there's more to say. but let's, let's start with this. How can there be two givers in a relationship? That's a great question. That's a great question. Listen carefully, uh, uh, J.R. Listen carefully. In your loving relationship, two people in a loving relationship, each one giving to the other, and the other one accepting graciously and lovingly, is not their acceptance a giving? Do you see that? When you give to someone you love, and they find that delicious, they love receiving from you, doesn't that make you feel good? Aren't they giving to you in that act of enjoying the pleasure you give them? Of course. If they're taking from you, they're enjoying the pleasure you give them just because they're interested in the pleasure. That's not a marriage, that's business. Or maybe prostitution. But if somebody is giving someone else pleasure and they enjoy the giving of the pleasure and the receiver enjoys that and it builds the love and relationship, that's, that's that's the fabric of a relationship. Okay. Carolina, we'll get to the details. One second. Still we... Still we... Paul, Paul, acceptance is an act of giving technically. Paul, you know that. You know that the Gemara says that if you accept something from someone who really badly wants to give it to you, you've given them a gift. You know that? Absolutely. Paul, let me give you an example. Paul, let's say you manufacture shoes. You manufacture shoes. And you desperately want to be known as the shoemaker to the queen. You would like to put on your logo, shoemaker to the queen. 
and you give the queen a pair of beautiful handmade shoes, right? And she accepts the shoes from you. And you can now say, you supply shoes to the queen. Who has given whom a bigger gift? Paul, I'm asking you a question. You give your shoes to the queen, and she publicly accepts them from you. Have you given her more, or has she given you more? By accepting your shoes, she's given you a much bigger gift than the pair of shoes that you gave her. Indeed, indeed. And the Gemara says, if you give somebody very honored a gift that they prepared to accept, and you know, Paul, you can, usually, you can even value it. You know, how, you know how mercenary this can be? We can put a price on it. Let's say you have a friend who knows the queen very well. And your friend can put a word in the queen's ear to induce her to accept your shoes. Would you pay your friend for such a service? You bet. A significant amount. Which means you'd pay for being able to give this gift. Because you're getting a value far greater than you're giving. Okay, anyway. That's a test technical halachic ramifications, that insight. So, let me just give you one expression of this and we'll turn to the halachic parameters very briefly. I'll give you an example. Society is made up of rights and obligations. It's well known in social theory. Every society is built on rights and obligations. The, um, the workers have a right to a, uh, a living wage. The employer has an obligation to pay a living wage. The uh, people have a right to free assembly. The government has an obligation to allow them to assemble. I have an obli- you, you have a right to free speech. I have an obligation to allow you to speak. You have a right to your property. I have an obligation not to steal. I think you can see this. This is a very well-known spectrum of societal rights and obligations. Now listen carefully to this. What defines a society is which of the rights or obligations do they see as primary. The rights or the obligations. Listen to this. It's an astounding insight. Rav Dessler makes this insight. Western democracies are founded on rights, not obligations. It's a bill of rights. Teach your rights. My son, you go out and fight for your rights. Don't let anyone trample on you. Fight for your rights. A bill of rights. A constitution which stipulates every citizen's rights. Rights are taking. Obligations are giving. My wife has a right to certain, receive certain things from me in the relationship. I have an obligation to give them to her. Rights are what you take. Obligations are what you give. In a society that's built on rights, you're training people to be takers. In Judaism, in our constitution, rights are never mentioned. The Torah, which is our obligation, mentions only obligations. The Torah mentions an obligation to treat somebody with kindness, to treat your employer with kindness. You have to treat him, you're not allowed to give an employer work that is thankless and pointless. Where does it ever say the, that, that you have a right to his work? Where does it say, the Torah never says you have a right to your property. It says, don't steal. gives you an obligation. The Talmud is full of rights. Of course, every right is a reciprocal end of an obligation. But our constitution mentions only the obligations. If you take care of your obligations, the rights take care of themselves. If you care, take care of your rights only, nothing takes care of itself. The workers want their rights, so they make a union to get their rights. Now the employers make a national association of employers to withhold. And you have a class war. You have a civil war. Economic war. In Judaism, you have to focus on your obligations. The servant or the worker has to work for you because that's his obligation. You have to treat him like a brother because that's your obligation. Two people taking care of their obligations, concerned only about what they have to give each other, is a blissful relationship. Two people concerned only about their rights, what you owe me, and she's thinking what I owe her, you have civil war. A culture that cultivates rights is a culture that cultivates taking. And people concerned about taking become takers in society. And no society, whether it's communism or capital, no society works that way. But as soon as people are brought, raised in society to take care of the public, let me just finish with one comment. A Jewish child should be raised to be conscious in their inner core only of their obligations. Only of the obligations. Take care of other people. Do not interfere with other people. Don't hurt other people. Be acutely aware of your, of your obligations. And wear a thick skin of fighting for your rights. Otherwise you'll get eaten alive. You have to have a shrewd exterior. You have to move in a world that's ready to eat you alive. With a protective layer. But inwardly in your trusted relationships. Only a giver. Okay. Those are the three things. Let us go. 
now that we've established what these three have in common, they self-changing, transform- transformational exercises. Tshuva is direct work changing yourself. Tfila is direct work on changing yourself. Direct in relationship with Hashem. And stoker is an expression of change. You give and give. The Rambam rules like this. He says, just to prove to you that stoker is designed to change you, I'll give you a proof. Stoker is not designed because society has needs. They're poor people. God can take care of those poor people at once. The reason God creates poor people in the world is to give you the chance to give to them. What does He need them in the world for? If God doesn't want poor people, He could give them Himself. Right? There are commentaries who point this out. The reason God allows poverty in the world is to, for you to live up to your obligations. To give them. And the reason He wants you to give them is because it changes you. He's not interested in... <laughs> He's not here to change himself. Let me give you a proof. Let me give you a proof. The Rambam rules. If you have a hundred pounds to give to charity, right? hundred pounds, a hundred rands. There was a time when that used to be money. A hundred dollars. And you have an option of giving a hundred pounds to one source in which there's a hundred pounds benefit or one single pound to a hundred different sources, in which case there will be a hundred pounds benefit. All else equal. I'm not talking about differential value. Stay with me. I'm talking about giving a hundred pounds to one person who will benefit a hundred pounds, or one pound to a hundred people who will benefit a hundred pounds in total. Which one should you do? One at a time, a hundred times, or one lump sum of a hundred? The Rambam rules, halachically, you're obliged to give a hundred single times. You know why? Because a hundred acts of giving will train you to be a giver. It's true, it's a small act. It's true. But there's a hundred times you've opened your hand and given. Why are we concerned about that? Because we're not concerned about the hundred pounds benefit in the world. That's the same either way. We want the self-transformational exercise of giving and giving. That's why you have to give standing up with your right hand. It's a mitzvah. You have to give with a smile. Right? Because it's a, there's an act of transformational transformation of personality. Okay, let us turn briefly to some of the halachic parameters. Again, there's no time to, 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 to fill it out, but just very, very briefly. Again, there's so many questions, you'll find them in the book that I recommended, but let's just talk very briefly about some of the parameters. First of all, how much do you have to give? Let's cover some of the bases. How much do you have to give? There are two aspects to the mitzvah, let's be clear about this. There's a thing called stocker. And Maiser, you see, it's called the book Stocker and Maiser. Tzedakah and Maaser. Stocker means charity, and Maiser means a tenth. The basic minimal mitzvah is Stocker. It's a very small amount. It's a third of a shekel, something like that, a year. How much is that? Very small amount. A couple of dollars, maybe. A dollar fifty, maybe. Um, less than that, maybe. In fact, the ancient custom of putting little uh, charity tins or uh, containers in, um, in uh, shuls throughout the world. You give a few pennies over the year, because the mitzvah is to give a, about a third of a shekel a year. You can get this book in any good Jewish bookstore. This is an art scroll book. If you can't get it online, any Jewish standard Jewish book, book, bookstore, easily obtainable. Um, and highly recommended. The... Um, the minimum amount of charity is a very, very small amount, and even a very poor person should give that. But there's a special custom, <coughs> custom halacha, of giving 10%, 10% of your income. So, we're not talking about the minimal mitzvah of stocker. Even a poor person should be giving that. We're talking about ma'asa, which is giving 10% of your income. One is required to give 10% of your after-tax income. Okay. Judy will come to whom you have to give, but one thing at a time, please. Yes, yes, street people collecting, Jews, non-Jews, will come to all of that. One thing at a time. First of all, how much? 10% of your after-tax income. To be a bit broader, not only after-tax, after all legitimate expenses earned in that amount of profit. I hope this is clear. So let's say you run a business, you buy and sell real estate. Over the course of the year, we're not interested in your gross income. We're interested in the profit left over after you've bought and sold. So let's say it cost you it cost you a certain amount to buy the real estate. And then there were taxes you paid. And there was capital gains tax. And then there was travel. Right? You needed travel. So we're talking about ex- expenditures expended in the direct pursuit. Not indirect. Direct 
pursuit. So at the end of the year, you net up your profit. It's very easy when you get a salary. Okay, if you get a salary, it's very easy calculation. Out of every month, you cream off the 10%. So the salary comes to your company, they're taken off your tax already. But the notion here is not only tax, it's all monies involved in earning. So it's talking about the net profit at the end of the period, whether it's every month, every year, whatever it is, it's probably better to do it every month. That is, what do you mean here or in Israel? Jonathan, I understand your question. It doesn't matter where you earn the money. It doesn't matter where you earn the money. So we're talking about 10% of your after-tax income, not after expenses, household expenses, and, and we're talking about 10% of profit after tax and after the expenses necessary to earn that amount of money. You may give up to 20%. You may give up to 20%. There was a Takona made at Usha during the Mishnahic period not to give more than 20. There were lots of people who used to give more than 20. If faith was great enough, well, I'm getting lots of questions. Hold the questions, please. I'm going to cover this slowly, one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Where to give money, I'll come to. Let's focus on one thing at a time. <laughs> can't, can't answer everything at once. One thing at a time. Before the Mishnahic period, there was no limit on how much money you could give. You wanted to give 50%, 100%. People had the faith. Hashem gave me today, he'll give me tomorrow. But there came a time in Jewish history where that was no longer genuine. We live in a generation where if there's not milk in the fridge for tomorrow morning, you're really anxious. If you live in a generation where it doesn't bother you in the least, Hashem gave me what I need today, He'll give me tomorrow. Give as much as you want. And He'll give you. But you can't fake that. And at Usha, the rabbis decided, the rabbis decided that we're no longer on that level. And therefore, they ruled that in order that you should not become needy and poor, no more than 20%. There are plenty of exceptions. Plenty of exceptions. I'm not going to cover them now. But the general rule we follow is not less than 10%. Some people are fussy to give exactly 10. They can then sometimes give more beyond that and not more than 20. That's an important rule. The exceptions of this time will cover them. Devorah, you're asking me from what money? So here's the rule. You're required to give 10% or up to 20 from any income at all. Salary, windfall, you win the premium bonds, you win the lottery, someone gives you a gift, your parents give you a gift, there's an inheritance from some aunt who passed on that you didn't know. You find money, it's irrelevant. Any income at all, income, liquid, money, you're required to give 10%. A u- unique windfall, you can give more than 10 Let's say you, you, you came, uh, you, a large amount of money arrived and you, or you found it, you can't find who to give it back to, you want to give half of it to stocker, you could do that, that's one of the, that's one of the pension, uh, the pension is not, this is yeah, pension is your is your is not counted as tax. Absolutely not. Absolutely. I'm not talking about a gov. Let me t- let me let me give you the rule for that. Here's the rule. Let's say somebody gives you something that is not money. Example: You work for a company, and they pay for your health insurance, or they put money away in a pension for you. Okay, or they buy you, uh, you know, some investment pension, for example. Here's the rule. Listen carefully. If that money that they're putting away for you is something you would have had to spend anyway, it's counted as income. So let's say you live in a country where it's accepted and normal to buy health insurance, and you definitely would have that obligation. The company happens to add to your salary health insurance as well. That's income. That's income because they saved you that expense. But let's say they they buy something that you never would have done. You have your own health insurance and they put more into it. right? They put away money for you that you would not normally have done. That's not, that's not, right? It's only stuff where they save you. Another example. Let's say your father arrives one day and he says, hmm, in this house I think you need a new, uh, you need a new, you need something new for your house and he gives you something expensive for your home. You're not required to take 10% of the value of what he gave you and give it to charity unless he saved you the expense. So let's say, let's say you need a new refrigerator. Okay? Your refrigerator is not working. You need a new one. Your father arrives one day and he says, I see you need a new fridge. Here it is. Yes. The couple hundred dollars that he spent on the fridge is income to you because he saved you the expense. You were going to buy it anyway. He saved you that cost. You give twenty twenty dollars of that. If he buys you a new one because he wants to, it was not an expense. You were going to something additional. He says, you know what? I think you need two refrigerators, and he gives you another one. No, you don't have to give charity from that. Right? I hope this is clear. Um. So, of which income? 
you are required to give. Let's talk briefly about a man and a woman. Man and a woman. Married couple. So if the man, let's say for argument's sake, it's a family where the man earns and works and the mother does not earn at all. Her job is homemaking, she doesn't earn. She may not give charity. She may not give charity unless it's an amount that he's agreed to as well. Again, he's earning the money. She has no right to give it away unless she knows that he agrees to that amount or small amounts. If, you're, if a woman gives a large amount of charity s telling you that her husband agrees to this, that's fine. <coughs> if she's earning, then of course she can and then she's obliged to. So if she earns independently, she must give 10% of what she earns. An unmarried woman has exactly the same obligations as a, as a married woman. Again, an unmarried woman has all the same obligations as a man. She's independently earning. But a partnership, when husband and wife are married together, depends who's doing the earning. Okay, so if one of them is earning, for argument's sake, the man, she can only give what they've agreed to give together. Okay, unless it's small amounts that he certainly would agree to. Um, so, the, that now, 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 to what should you give? To what should you give? Oh, by the way, by the way, you can also give your service. Let's say you are a an accountant, and you do what they call pro bono or pro deo work. So you do the accounts of a local orphanage, okay, and you don't charge them. You can consider the time you spent as stocker, namely what you could have billed. So let's say you bill $100 an hour, and you spend 10 hours doing the accounts, or you're a tax consultant and you do the taxes or the legal work for some charitable institution, and you would have billed $1,000 for that work. You can count $1,000 as having given from your miser minus the 10% you would have had to give. So you can count $900. I hope this is clear. Let's say you're a tailor and you, a young man's getting married and he can't afford any of his needs. So you make him a suit. You make him a suit. Now the suit you give him is not money, but it's miser. For example, let's say you give him a suit and this is a suit that you normally sell for $200 profit. You sell it for $300 and you make $200 profit on the suit. So now you've given this young man a suit, you can count $200 as having been given of your miser money. You didn't give money, but you gave your professional, right? You could legitimately have billed for that. So you gave away $200 of income minus the 10% that you would have had to give anyway. So $180 you can count as stocker money, right? I hope this is, I hope this is clear. Um, earnings, by the way, from a investments. For example, let's say you buy and you deal in real estate. Your own personal home is not like that. That's not, that's not the same. Let's say you buy a home, and many years later, 20 years later, you sell it for much, much more than you bought it for. You don't have to give MISA from the profit if a new home these days costs that much. Again, you made a lot more money than you paid 20 years ago, but it's still only enough to buy an equivalent home nowadays. Okay. However, if you're buying and selling real estate as a business, then of course, it has to be done from your, from your. Um, what do you mean? Can you give clothes? You can only give clothes that have a genuine value, or clothes that you would have sold at a certain at a certain cost minus the ten percent. Who should you give to? Okay, it's very important to know that when it comes to giving stocker, you have your own choice. It's a very personal issue. You need to give to valid causes. Now we're not talking about anti-Israel terrorist organizations. We're talking about uh, organizations or institutions that are valid from a Jewish point of view. You're also required to give to non-Jewish causes. It's very important in society. It should be done publicly and openly. But um, you are required to give to valid sources. You should diversify your giving. Ordinarily, under most circumstances, not more than 50% of your charitable donations to one place. Your parents come first. There's a hierarchy, first parents, then someone who taught you Torah for free, then your grandparents, then uncles and aunts, and then cousins, an ex-spouse, an ex-wife, even though, and there should be no relationship between divorced people in Judaism as far as possible, yet it's still a mitzvah to give to an ex-spouse if she needs it before a stranger. Friends come before strangers, neighbors come before strangers, people living in your city come before people in another city. In Judaism, there are devolving hierarchical concentric layers of responsibility. So someone living in your city comes before people in another city except Jerusalem. Yerushalayim, nominally, notionally, we all live there. So you can prioritize causes in, causes in Jerusalem equal to those in your city, 
after Jerusalem any place in Israel. Some say they're equivalent, some say not quite. Shlomo Avram, you're not allowed to give anything to anybody that will harm him. I'm talking about a smoker. You're not allowed to give him cigarettes. You can't give money to a drug addict if he's going to go buy drugs. Shlomo Avram, somebody knocks on your door. Please give me a cigarette. It's completely forbidden. Completely forbidden. Give me a drugs. Alcohol to an alcoholic. Completely forbidden. Can you give money to an alcoholic or a drug addict? Depends if you think he's going to go. If you think that he may buy drugs and harm himself, give him a sandwich. Give him food. Buy him a meal. Okay, use your head. Okay, children, interesting. Little children are your obligation. Older children are stocker. That means once they're ready beyond the age where you need to support them as part of your mitzvah of raising children, then it becomes already stocker. And children come before strangers. Are children allowed to give stocker from the money they receive from their parents? A student may not give money, may not give charity from what they receive from their parents, if that will require the parents to give them more. If the parent says, look, I don't mind if you give the charity, I want you to do that, it's good for you, and it's fine. that's fine. But if you are taking money from a parent while you're a student, and now you give 10% away of that, thinking you're being very religious, now your father needs to give you more, you have no right to give that money away. If you can give it away and live more frugally, without your parents having to give you more, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Sam, what do you think about that? You're going to give a gambling addict money that he's going to misuse and harm himself. You, you answer that question. Right? I'm sure, is borrowed money considered income? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And not only that. Borrowed money you need to pay back before you give charity. You give small amounts to charity. How much should you give to any individual? You shouldn't turn anyone away. Anyone. Teenagers need to give stocker from babysitting money. Absolutely, Alan. Absolutely, indeed. doesn't matter what they earn it from. They can earn it from their horse racing bets, or they can earn it from their... <laughs> from their internet sales or they can from their babysitting money absolutely by the way children from age 6 or so little kids should be trained to give away some of the money that they get given as gifts because it's important educationally your 21, 21 year old give him or a huge gift stock and goes for your mouse no Paul if you give a child a large gift l l let me make this clear you can only count charity money when you gave it to a needy cause when you give someone a big gift you have a 21-year-old child. You give him a very lavish gift. That's not called stocker. It has to be to a person who needs it. Now, there's a long discussion about who, who really is a person who needs. So the general concept of somebody who needs is they don't have enough money to subsist, to exist. Or a person who does, but they have a pressing need right now. So they have enough money to, to get by on, but now they're marrying a child, and they need to make a wedding. They can afford their normal expenses, but they can't afford the wedding. You can give them charity for that. Absolutely. Or their massive medical expense. You should not turn away anyone empty-handed. You should give at least a little bit to someone without asking any questions. But more, you should investigate. To give large amounts to somebody, you should be careful that it's a valid, a valid, um, a valid uh, cause. But you have the freedom to choose whom to give it to. Let me finish with one. I'm not sure what laundered money exactly how, how you how you judge that, uh, Carolina. There's a lot of prohibitions involved in that. If it's stolen stolen money, you right, you certainly you're certainly not obliged to give charity from the stolen money, you're obliged to give it all back. Beggars in the street, why not? Why not indeed? You should you give small amounts to people. Here's the rule. When a person goes to many people, you're required to give them small amounts. So so again, somebody goes from door to door, you should give them but a small amount because they collect it from many people. When a person does not collect from many people, they come to you personally, they're embarrassed. They can't admit that they need. They can't go to other people. Then you have an obligation to give more, if it's a valid cause. Ms. Shapiro, every solicitation letter, it's a very good midder to do that. You know what we do in England is people in England have little um, tear-off sheets, small, small amounts. In England, I'm not sure how it works in America, but in England, you can go to a charitable organization and give them a donation, and they sell you for that donation small, let's say, 50 cent or $1 um, tokens or uh, vouchers. So it's very easy when a solicitation letter comes, you can put in a small amount in every letter and send it back. It's a very nice thing to do. Aggressive beggars, you know, whether he's aggressive or not is irrelevant. He may be a person who's aggressive and he's a person who's, no, who's got problems. The problems you should give him in a kindly, kindly fashion. It's not, you to, not for you to take offense at his personality problems and difficulties. Um, 
Stock you give incorporated in your MISA. Stock incorporated in your MISA. I'm not sure what you mean. Stock and MISA is one. Yes, yes. You all, again, if you give your 10%, you've inc- 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 you certainly covered your, you've certainly covered your, um, your stock as well. Um, one final point. The Gemara says it's disgraceful <coughs> to support your parents out of your charity money. Let me say that again. Let's say you're a wealthy, comfortable individual and you have enough money to support your parents who need to be supported. That should be your privilege and your pleasure. And then over and above that, you give 10% of your income to charity as well. You should not use your charity money to support your parents. That is disgraceful. Unless you can't afford it. If all you can afford, you can, you can just exist on a certain amount, having given 10%, then all of that goes to your parents, not 50%. Then it should all go to your parents. They come far ahead of any other obligation. But if you can afford to support your parents, and yet, on top of that, give stocker, it's disgraceful to get away with your stocker money giving it to your parents. It should be your privilege and your honor. Okay, we run out of time. Howard, you have vouchers in Canada. Great. Should you give stocker every day? No, there's no specific mitzvah to do that. It's a great thing to do the mitzvah whenever you can. But you should do it routinely. Because if you start doing it at irregular intervals, it, bec- it no longer remains clear how much money has accrued during that time. If you run on negative, you are not obliged to give charity if you're running on negative for the right reason, because you can't afford it. If you're running on negative because you're gambling and giving away money and ridiculous... By the way, if a person spreads their money around with wanton abandon, they can give more than 20%. They show they're not... The reason you should not give more than 20% is because we're concerned you may become needy thereby. But if you show that you don't consider that a problem for yourself, you just spend money wantonly on anything and everything and you keep nothing in reserve, then of course you should be spending wantonly on your charity as well. Um, not give a beggar if you have some, you're walking past a mitzvah. Of course, indeed. If it's a valid, a valid source and you don't do it, you're walking past a mitzvah. Now you may have a reason, because you've planned to give it somewhere else. Absolutely. But it's up to you to, to judge where you give it. Mitzvah to put in stock a box or to actually give it. I don't get that, Elliot. Put your money in a box it's now di- you've divested yourself of that, and it will soon be given to a worthy source. That that's fine, absolutely fine. Um, many many nouns are female, Alan. <laughs> many nouns are female. Okay, um, one lump sum, put it into. No, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference. If it's, it's judged by the amount that you're giving, right? Oh, I see what you mean. No, to put the pennies into the box one at a time. If it's a developmental exercise in training your character, yes. Um, what's your question before? Bring the other two Ben Adam Markham. Yes, well, that's quite correct. Stocker is between you and human beings primarily, and Tfila and Chuva. Chuva is a mitzvah. By the way, since you raised that question, let me maybe I'll finish with this. I'm not sure who AC is, but let me. Should you go negative in MISA accounting and credit against future income? You're not required to do that. No, if you haven't got the income yet, you don't have to give it. Why would you? Why would you do that? No, you can count it that way. Let's say you gave more than you should have now. So more than you, again, over a six-month period, a one-month period, you normally give a certain amount, and now you give more one month, intending to give less the next month. That's okay, as long as you're keeping a calculation at certain fixed fixed intervals. Why is the number ten percent? Because Yaakov Avinu said to Hashem, "I will give you ten percent of everything you give me." Why 10% is, is, is spiritually significant, I can't go into now. Um, run a charity of a non-Jewish organization? No. There is, Romi, there is a mitzvah to give non-Jewish causes, and it should be done publicly, but it shouldn't be, you, you, you should not be giving all your 10% to a non-Jewish cause. No. No. The simple reason is that there's concentric layers of obligation, and you're related to Jews, so they come first. Um, Charitable to make profits, investment of their money, give all their profit away. I don't quite follow that question. Let me answer AC's question and finish with that just because we run out of time. And that is um, these three mitzvahs stays. I hope you'll enjoy this. Tshuva, Tfil, and Stoker cover the three bases of what it is to be human. Tshuva means correct relationship to yourself, fixing yourself up. Tfila, relationship with Hashem, you're speaking to Him correctly. Stoker, other people. The Maral says, there are three uh, circles that you should be living in. Three areas of character. Three, three types of relationship that need attention, close attention. The first and foremost is you and yourself. Not you and God. You and yourself. 
If you're not worth something to yourself, you're not worth much to God or anybody else. In a marriage or a friendship, you need to be a somebody to be a giver in a relationship. If you're a nobody, then there's nobody giving. So tshuva fixes you. Then there's God. And tefillah fixes your relationship with God. You're speaking to Him correctly. And stalker fixes your relationship with other people. There are only three layers to your interactions in the world. Your relationship with yourself, relationship with God, relationship with others. Tshuva fixes yourself. Tefillah fixes relationship with God. You're a giver to yourself. You're a giver in relationship to Hashem. You're giving yourself to Him. And stalker, you're giving of yourself to others. So on all three layers, you're becoming a giver. Gemma, thank you very much. We've run way out of time. I'm sorry to have gone a little bit over. There's so much more to say. But this isn't a basic approach. There are many other aspects of stock here we didn't deal with. The exceptions when you can give more than 20. Many other things. But I hope this you'll find this a useful introduction. After all, our agenda here was to establish the depth of the mitzvahs more than the practicalities. And I hope you appreciate next time you give money to somebody or you work for them or you give stocker, this is a transmutational, transformational exercise. You, you transmuting yourself into a divine giver. Thank you very much. Thanks to Jem and thanks to all of you.